tissues, which sort of were actually discovered synthetically before they were found in nature, most of the work that we've done is in some way inspired by fungal natural products or plant alkaloids. So I'm going to emphasize maybe, there, I mean, there's too many to count, but these are six weird ones that I consider sort of interesting that are uh, powerful compounds that have been isolated from fungi. One is calibolide. Is anyone here familiar with this? It's had a kind of a weird history where in 2016, a paper came out um, on this compound called calibolide that was found in a mushroom species called the Rhodocalibia maculata. And I don't know, are there any people interested in chemistry here? <laughs> oh, damn, all right. Um, okay, so maybe you're looking at this and you realize, okay, it's interesting. It doesn't contain a basic nitrogen or a nitrogen of any kind, and it's got all these chiral centers. And you might also notice that it kind of looks like the chemical salvinorin A. And the people who were studying it had the same thought. So they thought, all right, this kind of looks like salvinorin A. Let's see if it interacts with the kappa opioid receptor, which is the selective target of salvinorin A. And they published this study that was a little weird, but it suggested that it had activity as a kappa opioid receptor agonist that was maybe roughly comparable to salvinorin A, but less potent, but maybe same ballpark. And this was a very provocative idea because it meant that there could be a completely different type of psychedelic mushroom. Um, just a, a different type of mechanism, a different type of chemical, potentially a different type of experience. And nobody had ever found a kappa agonist in fungi, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, and I got very excited about this, and I even uh, spoke about it in a 2018 podcast with Joe Rogan, which then made a lot of people interested in it, and people started eating Rhodocalibia maculata, trying to trip on it. And, uh, and then a subsequent analysis came out showing that the 2016 paper was wrong, and it actually uh, does not appear to act as a cap agonist, so no one was hurt, at least. <laughs> Then there is muscimol, which I'm sure a good oh number of you are familiar with, is a compound that has been isolated from Amanita muscaria, it's Amanita species. It is very unusual as a psychedelic, both structurally and pharmacologically, because it's not serotonergic in its mechanisms, it's acting as an agonist for GABA-A receptors, where it's um, unlike something like Valium or something like that, where it's acting as a positive allosteric modulator. This is directly binding to the same site as GABA, the endogenous ligand for that receptor, and it produces a kind of um, weird, dreamy delirium that I kind of like, actually. And um, I'm surprised that nobody has harnessed this medicine. Um, there's a lot of traditional uses and there's a lot of kind of um, alternative uses of it, but it seems like it has potential beyond that. And Merck actually made a, a confirmationally constrained variant of muscimol called gaboxidol that made it through phase three clinical trials and then they pulled it because it was uh, too psychedelic so that i guess was a problem for them um i've used i've used the compound gaboxidol i think it's great it's a, actually a, a real shame that they pulled it then there is muscarin uh, muscarin is also present in amity muscaria but at lower concentrations that's where the name comes from but it's present in a number of toxic Clitosibi species and other species in general, it has a, an interesting aspect of its chemistry, which is that if you look at the nitrogen, it has four different substituents. It's called a quaternary ammonium cation, which gives it a charge that makes it very difficult for it to cross into the brain. So muscarin is exerting its effect in the periphery where it binds to a subtype of acetylcholine receptor called the muscarinic receptor, named after muscarin. And it exerts a kind of prototypical parasympathetic nervous system activation where there is salivation, lacrimation, um, and uh, constriction of the pupils. And at high doses, it can actually be fatal and seems like a horrible way to die. So, um, But it's, it's very easy to treat poisoning with an anticholinergic drug like atropine or probably even Benadryl. Um, so it's, it's not a common scenario that people uh, die from muscarin poisoning, and if you are poisoned by it, you should be just fine. It's not like eating a uh, death cap or something like that. Then there are the ergolines, LSA and LSH, which are found in a variety 
of different fungi, and the genus Claviceps are also present in some entomopathogenic metarhizium species. These are interesting because they're obviously very closely structurally related to LSD, um, but their activity in humans is not as well characterized as you might think because there's, of course, plenty of reports of people consuming morning glory seeds and wine baby woodrow seeds, but in terms of human self-experiments with D lysergic acid amide, Albert Hoffman did it, and there isn't really all that much else out there. So the exact nature of the activity is more ambiguous than you might expect, and the same is true for this hydroxyethyl LSA, which is sometimes referred to as LSH or LAH, which I think is a terrible name for it because it's also the name for a powerful reducing agent like aluminum hydride. So, uh, so this uh, this compound is probably unstable, but it has been implicated in some hypothetical explanations for why the kaikion of the Eleusinian mysteries can't be replicated. Like this is kind of like the thing that people point to is like maybe that maybe this is the thing uh, because it seems like it could be more LSD-like in its activity, but it's so unstable. This is like a, a hemiaminal that would be a sort of intermediate in the formation of an imine if you condensed LSA with uh, acetaldehyde. But even the whole chemistry of it, I find sort of suspect and weird. Um, and there is not much convincing pharmacology on it. So that's like a kind of another one of these simple compounds that remains pharmacologically um, uninvestigated. And then in 2013, there was a, a paper that just showed this totally new thing that I thought was pretty fascinating. Did anyone else see this? This uh, purpurocyanine? Anyone see this paper? Someone did. Okay, one person. <laughs> in, uh, in this uh, Cortinarius purpurescens. And this is actually, again, I was talking earlier about how sometimes we make these things synthetically and then find something analogous in nature. And this is one of those situations where pharmaceutical companies had actually already studied this tricyclic motif where you have a, a sort of tryptamine where the side chain is bent back toward the four position of the indole ring. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be more active in my scroll <laughs> No, no, it's fine. I think this is fine. Um, Okay, so this is a, an interesting structure. They actually looked at it to see if it interacted with 5-HT2A, which again is the serotonin receptor that's most commonly implicated in the action of classical psychedelics. And it did not act as an agonist, which is not surprising given some weird aspects of this structure. But you could maybe imagine how it could be modified to create a new class of psychedelics. Maybe you reduce the imine with lithium aluminum hydride or sodium boral hydride or something and decarboxylate and resolve the enantiomers and maybe there's something interesting there. And that's, I mean, this kind of union of human chemistry and enzymatic chemistry from fungi has been an immensely important process historically. That's how LSD was made. You know, the fungi are doing the majority of the heavy lifting, but then the humans come in and add that diethyl amide group and, and uh, it's, it's really very impressive what comes out of it. Oh. Yeah. Um, so then these are the, the fungal, uh, uh, oh, no, I think I did it. I think I did it. Okay, so these are, uh, it's very eager to <laughs> highlight this text. <laughs> There's no way. You think they'll maybe they'll just want more after that. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Well, anyway, you already know all these structures most likely. So these are the compounds that are most commonly found in psilocybin-containing mushrooms, and you often find some mixture of these six. Much love, Papa Smurf. I appreciate species. you coming in, brother. Usually the ones other than psilocin and psilocybin are only present in trace concentrations. And now the people have become increasingly interested in this territory and that there are people who are doing serious chemical analysis of different strains and really figuring out what makes different species and different strains different from one another. 
a lot of people are wondering whether or not these different alkaloids could be contributing to the psychopharmacology of the mushroom experience. And at this point, no one really knows with certainty. Um, again, sort of like what happened with LSA and LSH, um, there is a dearth of carefully conducted human self-experiments with a lot of these compounds that would help answer these basic questions about whether or not they are contributing to the activity because this is, you know, actually these answers are not so hard to acquire. You know, you just take the drug and figure out if it's active or not. That's, that's pretty much what you need to do. Um, but norbeocystin, probably not active. This is, I mean, at the very least, it would be a prodrug for 4-hydroxy tryptamine, which I can't expect, I wouldn't expect to be active, very polar. Beocystin, and there's sort of conflicting information about that. There's a report from Yoshin Gartz where he claims that it's equipotent with psilocybin. That seems very, very unlikely to me. Um, and 4-hydroxy NMT or norcilicin has been tested in uh, IV or I am, and maybe IV as well, self-experiments and did not exert any activity. So that doesn't bode well for beocystin, but maybe it exerts some kind of modulatory effect. Who knows? I mean, these things do need to be tested a little more carefully. Then psilocybin, as you all likely know, is a prodrug for psilocin. Psilocybin in and of itself does not appear to exert any kind of pharmacological activity until an enzyme called alkaline phosphatase dephosphorylates the oxygen creating this uh, free phenolic oxygen. And then finally, there's aeroginosin, which is, again, like muscarin, a quaternary ammonium cation. And for the same reasons that muscarin doesn't enter the brain, it's very unlikely that aeroginosin will enter the brain due to this charge on the nitrogen. Um, there is a pharmacologist named Grant Glatfelter who did a paper on these tryptamine quaternary ammonium cations, and he found that they did actually have some pharmacological activity as basically SSRIs. Um, but again, the meaning of that is a little bit difficult to interpret because they won't be able to enter the brain. Um, and this is kind of, again, this is a problem with some of the Paul Stamets work as well in, in some of his uh, patents, is if you're looking at these things in vitro, you can arrive at false conclusions about the activity because the way that a drug is trafficked around the body is very much a product of its individual chemistry and polarity. So this is just to give an example of that, this is psilocin, and, if, and this is a uh, graph of the distribution of microspecies of psilocin at different pH levels. And what you'll find is... Oh boy. <laughs> we lost power. We're, Will is on it. <laughs> it's all your fault, Pop Smurf. <laughs> Seeing this man speak just made my whole trip worth it. Yeah, um, they keep losing electricity here and there. It rained out real bad a little while ago, so chances are there's a blown breaker somewhere. Earlier, when it was storming out, people's people were losing the the uh, awnings or the the tops of their tents, their easy up tents for their tables. A lot of people were they had to go chasing them. Oh boy.
Yeah, I would have had power here within a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we really wanted to hear about the pH. So, this is a, a sort of important point, but it's potentially very boring. Um, for anyone here that is familiar with how DMT is extracted from plants, you might understand I sure am. that you have a, a bark that contains DMT. You grind it up into a powder. You disperse it in water with a base. The base deprotonates the basic nitrogen so that it is no longer as soluble in water. And then you partition it into a nonpolar solvent where it is more soluble. So that's kind of the essential idea behind a lot of alkaloid extraction is create a situation where the alkaloid is uncharged and then partition it into a nonpolar solvent. With psilocin, you can't do that because, and the same is also true of psilocybin, because there is no pH where it is uncharged. If you have a very basic environment, it will pull the hydrogen off of the phenolic oxygen and you'll get a sodium phenoxide or potassium phenoxide ion. And if you have the don't have a sufficiently basic environment, then the nitrogen will remain protonated. And at any pH, you'll have some combination of those. Uh, in the kind of in the perfect range around nine, you still have about fifty percent charge. So this is a uh, one of the complicating factors in terms of the pharmacokinetics of this drug and how it is extracted. And in terms of making psilocin type compounds in a lab, you have to treat them very carefully. Like uh, once you have them in water, it is immensely difficult to figure out a way to partition them into any kind of non-polar environment. And given all this, it's especially impressive that Albert Hoffman was able to figure any of this out in a single year in 1958 he simultaneously isolated and synthesized psilocybin, which, I mean, it's very easy to take this stuff for granted, but even figuring out the structure of this must have been um, extremely difficult. This was the, the first phosphorus-containing tryptamine that had ever been found, and it remains very unusual. You don't really see things like that very often in nature. And he devised a way to make psilocybin using a synthetic process that had been developed by these two American chemists at Upjohn Pharmaceuticals in Kalamazoo, Michigan. These guys, Speeder and Anthony. And the idea was that he would work around the instability of the 4-hydroxyindole, which when you treat it with base, immediately starts to polymerize, forming the same nice, sorts man. of colored compounds that you see in a bruised mushroom, that he would protect the oxygen using a benzyl so. group, and then build the side chain of the tryptamine molecule using oxalic chloride and the dimethylamine, then he would reduce that to the tryptamine, debenzylate with hydrogen and palladium on carbon. And that was already uh, pretty complicated chemistry. Like I've done this sort of thing before and that's already really uh, can be a mess. And then as if that weren't bad enough, he then has to install this phosphate ester on the oxygen to convert the psilocin from psilocybin, and he had to use this explosive reagent, OO dibenzyl phosphoryl chloride, and then do a final hydrogenolysis of the benzyl group. So this was kind of like insane chemistry, and you can probably imagine why it is that most people prefer to grow mushrooms <laughs> instead of, uh, and it was also low yielding and expensive, and pretty much every bad thing and dangerous. It's, it's just any, any bad thing that can happen in chemistry was uh, the case for that synthesis. But even with mushrooms, see that and it bruised the mushrooms creating this blue discoloration um, depending on the variety of mushroom and the relative concentrations of psilocin and psilocybin the mushroom species and varieties that contain predominantly psilocin appear to uh, create this kind of blue polymer polymer more readily you can also do this uh, in the lab in vitro with just something like 4-ACO-DMT, if you treat it with acid, um, you see the same formation of the blue polymer, uh, which is what is featured in that picture. And this problem becomes more extreme depending on exactly what 4-hydroxytryptamine you're making. So one of the issues with these baocystin type compounds is that if you have, if the product is a secondary amine like baocystin or 4 hydroxy NMT, they're even less stable than the tertiary amines like the respective 4 uh, hydroxy DMT type compounds or psilocin type compounds. So 
at this stage in the synthesis, typically these tryptamines are highly stable. You have the oxygen protected with the benzyl group, the nitrogen is not basic, it's still an amide, and even at this intermediate, this is probably like 10 years ago when I was trying to make hydroxy NMT, um, it just immediately polymerized into this purple goo. So uh, the chemistry of this stuff can be a real nightmare, and no one actually understood exactly why this was happening until a couple years ago. Alexander Sherwood published a paper where he characterized the mechanism through which these 4-hydroxy indoles polymerize to produce these colored compounds. And this is not, again, this is not a silicin specific phenomenon. This happens with pretty much any 4-hydroxy tryptamine. The one in that photo is just a really weird thing that I was making that is nothing like any 4-hydroxy tryptamine found in nature, and yet it still produced this uh, glorious blue color. Um, but uh, uh, you can see the pathway where the when the oxygen is not protected by the phosphate group, you get dimerization and then oligomerization in these different positions on the ring. And the position where it begins to polymerize dictates the color of the polymer. So some of them are blue and some of them have more of a, a green coloration. And, you know, this chemistry is like a kind of a nightmare sometimes, but it has allowed us to understand a huge amount about the structure activity relationship of psilocin derivatives. Because if everybody's interested in aeroginosin and baocystin and all of these different things, then it, it stands <coughs> to reason that many of the synthetic variants also will have interesting properties. And this is from a, a recent paper by Adam Halberstadt, where he looked at the head twitch response, which is a, a way of measuring uh, what could be argued to be psychedelic activity in rodents, but obviously there's some weirdness with that interpretation. But in any case, when you inject a rodent with a psychedelic, they twitch their head in a particular way. And this is used as a uh, metric of psychedelic activity in rodents. So he compared 4-hydroxy DMT, i.e. psilocin, 4-hydroxy DET, which was also made by Albert Hoffman as the first synthetic psilocin variant, 4-hydroxy DPT, 4-hydroxy DIPT, 4-hydroxy MET, 4-hydroxy MPT, 4-hydroxy MALT, 4-hydroxy MIPT, and 4-hydroxy EPT. It's a very impressive paper. And, uh, and, and looked at both the 4-hydroxy and 4-acetoxy counterparts of all of these compounds and then compared them in rodents. And what he found is that, yeah, there's differences. All these different compounds have different potencies. The psilocin and 4-hydroxy MET are particularly robust in terms of inducing the head twitch response in rodents, and I think, I really wonder why a lot of this stuff wasn't explored around the same time that Sandoz was exploring LSD. I mean, they, they did a little bit, they had 4-hydroxy DET, but that was about it, and I wonder if it was because the chemistry was simply more challenging, I, I don't know, but I do know that with LSD, they had, you know, specialized packaging, they had a product insert, they had literature for investigators, but with psilocybin, they usually just had it in these like bottles with a generic label written on a typewriter. And this is the only photo I've ever seen, I found it recently, of a actual labeled psilocybin ampule from Sandoz um, with the Indocybin trade name that they used. Uh, I think I'm like almost, well, I, I could keep talking about this chemistry stuff, but I can also just do questions because I think we're over time due to the Nobody cares. Okay, I'm going to talk a tiny bit more about, uh, about, <laughs> about about this final final innovation in the chemistry. So I talked about this uh, this kind of insane way that Albert Hoffman did the original synthesis of psilocybin and how daunting that was. And nobody really wanted to do that kind of chemistry, including seemingly people at Sandoz, although I could be wrong about that. Um, and so often it is the case that it takes some kind of innovation in the realm of the synthesis to make these substances more accessible. And when I was just naming that long list of psilocin analogs that had been looked at by Adam Halberstadt in the head twitch response, the only way they were able to make so many of these compounds, and there's probably a few people here that have tried some of those things, right? And imagine. Okay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> happens to be Soren, my friend. <laughs> You're amongst friends. <laughs> my friend has, but, uh, but, but anyway. So, um, yeah, so, and the reason that that they are available as research chemicals is because, I think, largely because of the contributions of this one chemist named David Rapke, who never gets any credit, um, he was 
in fact, not only does he not get credit, <laughs> the chemistry is sometimes attributed to a Japanese chemist named Shiroda, who is not responsible for this work. So his little, but I think substantial, innovation was instead of starting with four benzyloxyindole and started with four acetoxyindole, and that eliminates the synthetic step. So you can basically make them in the exact same number of steps as you would if you were making DMT synthetically, because in the final step of lithium aluminum hydride reduction, it simultaneously reduces the ketone in the beta position and the amide, and it hydrolyzes the acetate ester. So you get the, the final psilocin compound, which is really uh, changed the game in terms of providing more access to these compounds. This is essentially how chemists in China were able to make these for the gray market. And, and even this is a, a photo from a clandestine psilocin lab that's making uh, multi-kilogram batches of psilocin for distribution on the non-medical market. And they are again using this exact chemistry that was developed by David Repke here. At this photo, you can see the uh, acid chloride intermediate right before the addition of the dimethylamine. So that's what that looks like. Um, OK, actually, yeah, let's do questions before I get into like, I was going to do it, talk about the silomethoxin and stuff, but let's, let's, do, yeah, let's do questions. Any if anyone has that, or if we have time. Do we have time? Yeah, we have time. OK. I have a question. Yeah, yeah, who uh, how you doing? <laughs> I wrote it down while you were talking. Do you want to come over here? Yeah. How you doing? <laughs> so, my question for you is, um, one, why do you think we continuously take something like a mushroom or any object in nature and just take compounds out of it and play with them rather than allowing mother nature to do its thing and we just observe and that last breakthrough you you talked about kind of explained that like showed that and i was wondering do you see science in like health my combining together to die. Uh, with Mother Nature and uh, kind of allowing the alchemy to do and us just observe and work with rather than taking away and then forcing. Um, yeah, in a sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, taking away and forcing, that seems a little, a little yeah, rough. Word, yeah, I, I, don't know. I don't know about that. But in, in terms of letting mother nature do her thing, I think a lot of people do. I mean, you can, there's nothing stopping people from, um, you know, just only consuming a mushroom that is growing on the forest floor in the most natural, imaginable way. You could just eat it right off the ground and that's fine. You're welcome to do that. Um, there are concerns about sustainability sometimes with mushrooms. It's never been totally clear to me exactly how much of an issue sustainability is with over harvesting. I think conceivably it could be one, but picking them in such a way that they damage the mycelium and aren't spores that it could represent a problem. And then this is also kind of, a, I think, a spiritual question as well, uh, a spiritual question that's being applied to a materialist issue. So if you feel a spiritual connection with a plant or a fungus, which is totally fine, then that's that's good. That, that's your way of, of interacting with that organism. But for other people, they have a different interpretation. They see it as that is made of molecules. And so there's no reason not to investigate those molecules to see how they can be produced in the most efficient, least expensive, potentially most therapeutic way. Like another example would be um, the possibility that interaction of psilocin with the 5-HD2B receptor could confer some kind of cardiotoxic effect with long-term use. There isn't really strong evidence for that, but it has been suggested by one paper, and it is a fact that it is binding to 5-HD2B, and it is a fact that 5-HD2B is implicated really much. Wouldn't that be nice? Maybe that would make them a little bit safer. So that's the thing that people are doing, is seeing... You know, is LSA fine the way it is? Pro 
Probably. Yeah, I guess so. It seems like LSD works a lot better for a lot of people. Um, it seems like most people that have access to LSD prefer that over Hawaiian baby Woodrow seeds, although I'm sure there's some people that would choose the Hawaiian baby Woodrow seeds. Um, so it's just a, it's a matter of taste and one's personal connection to a plant or a fungus and how they conceptualize that organism and yeah, so there's, there's no answer to that, really. But I don't think it, there was sort of an implication in your question. I thought that there was something bad about uh, chemistry, and I don't think that's the case. And I think it, it actually has the potential to uh, relieve certain pressures on the natural world, uh, especially in, in more threatened organisms like Bufo alvarius or something like that. If anybody else has questions, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the front so that everybody can hear your question. Yeah. Great talk so far. Um, yeah, um, quick question. We kind of talked a lot about the enzymatic heavy lifting a lot of fungi are doing, um, given the fact that most chemistry, most of this chemistry is inorganic or organic, but you're using a lot of reagents and a lot of waste and heat and efficiency. So I remember we hearing about an anecdote from a person at TCAP. And Shogun uh, actually dosed the substrate of a number of things philosophy and made modifications on some of the uh, tryptamines. Um, is there any experience in like using solid state fermentation, adding some of these precursors to allow modifications for novel like, uh, side products that are uh, sudden, like secondary or tertiary metabolism, or just you know as those interesting coincidence of using whatever's around? Yeah, that, that's actually what I was about to talk about. It's the next slide, right? Here. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, so the, the work that Shulgin is referencing in Tikal is the work by this chemist, Yoshin Gartz, who um, had this exact idea is what if you can bridge the two, the world of organic synthesis and enzymatic synthesis, what if you could dope the substrate of a mushroom and either augment the levels at which it is producing these compounds like psilocin and psilocybin or even give it precursors that it otherwise would not have and allow it to produce compounds that would otherwise be unnatural. So he started out testing the addition of tryptamine to the substrate. And what he observed in this paper was that uh, it increased the amount of psilocin in psilocin cubensis to such an extent that I think to this day, this is the highest recorded concentration ever found in psilocin cubensis, 3.3% by dry mass. Um, so that's easy and cheap and doesn't require any kind of toxic chemicals. Just add some tryptamine to the substrate. It's not a controlled substance. That is kind of surprising to me that more people have not tested that. But then he took it to uh, the next level and he Thank added you for stopping a in, brother. synthetic compound to the substrate, which was DET. And what he found, and supposedly this photo, is a mushroom that is not producing psilocin or psilocybin, pcubensis, that is not producing any of the classical tryptamine alkaloids, but instead is producing 4-hydroxy-DET and the phosphate ester of 4-hydroxy-DET. So otherwise completely synthetic compounds being produced inside of a mushroom. And this is a very provocative idea um, that it, what's most amazing about it is nobody seems to have attempted to reproduce these findings. This is stuff from the 80s, and uh, people continuously talk about it. Then Gartz got arrested, and um, after his arrest, people started calling some of this research into question. There were accusations that he had created a fake photo of Solospi semilanciata that he had claimed to have grown in this Erlenmeyer flask. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that, but <laughs> that is one of the things he was accused of, was faking this uh, Solospi semilanciata cultivation. And also, he's the source of this dubious claim that theocystine is equipotent in psilocybin. But, um, this became a really big thing recently because there was a church called the Church of Psilomethoxin that wanted to do some variation of this where they put 5-MeO-DMT into the substrate of mushrooms and they thought that it would produce an entirely new compound that they called psilomethoxin, or not actually new, it had been made by this French chemist, Marc Julia, in the 1960s. But it had never been produced enzymatically and the Julia synthesis was even worse by a huge margin than the Hoffman synthesis of psilocybin. This is like a true nightmare. And, um, and so if you could make it just by adding 5-MeO-tryptamine or 5-MeO-DMT, I don't know why they use 5-MeO-DMT, but they did, 
um, wouldn't that be so much better? It was a very tantalizing possibility. And that they did neat. claim that it worked and sent me a sample for chemical analysis. And I did not detect any at all. And I told them. And then they sent me another sample. And I, again, did not detect any silomethoxin at all. But I did detect ketamine in the mushroom, which was a little weird. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I said, does that surprise you? And they responded with a thumbs up emoji. <laughs> 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 I don't know what to make of that. That's awesome. And then at the recent MAPS conference, all these people were coming up to me saying, like, oh, it's real, it's real, I'm experiencing it right now. And I, and I, I wonder if they were all just taking uh, a mushroom that was mixed with ketamine. Uh, I, mean, I think that is very much a possibility. So, yeah, in, in response to your question, is there a hybrid between the world of uh, in vitro organic? organic synthesis and enzymatic synthesis in a fungus, the answer appears to be yes, but um, as interesting as this work is, it, it has not really been reproduced, and I think this is like exactly the sort of thing that people should be investigating, because even if these specific recent claims are fraudulent, I don't think that that means that it's impossible to pull something like this off. Psilocybin is being uh, given for these uh, therapies are usually through this GMP mass production, making E. coli express the three genes and giving it a really cheap byproduct. Um, do you think that once we figure out like how nature makes these chemicals, what enzymes we need to express, can we just like feed it to a bacteria and then just um, avoid the chemistry altogether? How do you see those two ways of making those products come together. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the, as things currently stand, the two groups, three groups of psilocybin in clinical trials at the moment, there's filament, which are using a mushroom extract, then there's USONA, which are making it synthetically using the same process that I described <laughs> in Compass, are also using the exact same process, both variations of the chemistry that was developed by David Repke in the 19, late 1970s. Um, and could it be done by yeast? Yeah, it, it could, and it already has been. I think that at this juncture, the quantities are so small. Like, just keep in mind, the, like, the global consumption of psilocybin in terms of the GMP product for these clinical trials is like a, less than a gram or something like that. Like, it's very, maybe, maybe it only needs a couple grams. But we're not talking about massive quantities of anything. So, um, the efficiency of the production is not really like the, the primary concern, and this is like decently efficient. But filament, like I said, is doing it with a, a mushroom extract, and I don't doubt that people will continue to explore that. And of course, uh, mushrooms are already doing that, so you don't even need to like genetically engineer a variety of E. coli to do this. Like mushrooms are are uh, doing it pretty damn well. I think. Any other questions? You had mentioned your work with 5-fluoro DMT. And um, I know at the Oakland Psychedelic Conference, no, I'm sorry, California Psychedelic Conference, somebody asked you about. Um, I was wondering if you're familiar with 5-bromo DMT from sea sponges, specifically the work by Arlette Longion in 20, 2011. If not, it's something I would like to, if you are familiar with. If not, are you interested in things like that? Because again, you work with 5-fluoro DMT. You said it increased efficiency of the binding and the effects. Would the same possibly be true of 5-bromo? Or even the 5-6-dibromo that also exists? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually published the first human self-experiment with 5-bromo DMT. So, I was waiting for him to say something yeah. about about that. I've, I've made it. Uh, I've published on what happens when humans smoke and take it orally. And then after I published that in the article that was called CDMT, uh, it then became available as a research chemical. And there's a number of reports on Reddit of people even IV injecting 5-bromo-DMT. Um, 
And 5-bromo-DMT is active as a psychedelic, but it's way down in potency relative to DMT. So it's not, the flor fluorine is very different from the other halogens in terms of the effects that it will have on a molecule. And 5-chloro-DMT um, and 5-bromo-DMT are down in potency from DMT, but 5 Fluoro in general, general not just talking about the DMTs, but just generally speaking, seems to um, confer an interesting. Like, it's amazing to me that 5 bromo DMT is the only confirmed site that's ever been isolated from the ocean. That's, that's pretty damn wild. Some similar stuff, like there's a chemical from sponges that looks like, uh, like an earth pebosin. And uh, I doubt the pebosin itself. I percent psychedelic, left. but it could potentially be modified into something that would be. And then, yeah, there's yeah, there's some weird stuff. It's it's, it's like yeah, I'm, yeah, the answer is yes. I'm extremely interested. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you everyone for coming. Awesome. I am so glad. Many many thanks to Hamilton. That was last minute. I'm glad we were able to work it out. That's super awesome and a great addition to MycoFest, and I hope that you return to many more into the future. Um, we, uh, you know, as, as everybody can tell, are an hour behind schedule, but that means that we're right on time. Uh, and uh, uh, I wanted to make an announcement while I had everybody here that Alan Rockefeller, um, if you want to raise your hand so everybody can tell who you are with the amazing iNaturalist hat, uh, will be leading a UV foray around the uh, camp trail yeah, around 9.30. Um, so if anybody wanted to go out on that UV foray, um, you can catch that. There are going to be uh, UV flashlights looking at fluorescent organisms. I brought mine. Um, uh, I think that the best place to meet would be by the welcome tent, honestly. Um, if everybody's gonna walk down there, um, and I think that'd be the most ideal so there's not a bunch of cars jumbling up and I'm sure that not many people have their cars up here anyways. Um, so I think by the welcome tent and then heading down uh, would be the best bet um, into the forest and walking along the forest trail. Uh, 9.30 for the uh, UV walk with Alan Rockefeller at the welcome tent. Uh, other than that, uh, live music is going to get started here in the next 15 minutes or so, and it's going to go uh, for about three hours. Um, we've got uh, DJ Haife Hongos. i got to charge my battery for this because this dude is awesome. we got a little awesome. of It's Cosmic and Squawk. All right, everyone. And we're Pardon finishing me. off the night I'm with... I'm going to end this, oh, mind, this like? and cut this stream off before my battery totally dies. I want to thank you all for joining me. I appreciate you guys. Much love, everyone. I'll be back a little later if you're interested in coming back. Um, I got to get some charge to the battery. All right. Much love, everyone. I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you for swinging by Furry Plants and Coins, Papa Smurf, Jay Tizzo, Mrs. Tizzo. I saw you guys commenting, and I'm sorry I couldn't chat with you. But... This was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, as far as I'm aware. Getting to, to see Hamilton Morris speak in person, oh, man, this just made my weekend. All right, I will be live streaming again a little later, and I will catch you guys soon. Much love.